That's right, exactly. Um, and then we'll hear from Marta Reina Campos uh, from McMaster. Where is Ryan? Hello. Oh, over there. Um, and uh, she will talk about uh, steering up the interstellar medium with clusters, cluster feedback. Um, and then we'll hear from uh, Jared Bosberg uh, from Flat Iron, right over there, <laughs> who will tell us about the progenitors of type 2B supernovae. Yellow super giants in 1D and 3D. Uh, to the students, I just wanted to comment that astronomy is one of these fields where we find the adjectives of objects in the sky that are not necessarily politically correct, like yellow super giants or black holes or white dwarfs. Don't say that to any person. Uh, and then uh, finally, we we'll hear from uh, Thor Francisco Park, uh, also from Harvard. Here he is. And uh, he will tell us about debiasing with diffusion, probabilistic reconstruction of dark matter field from galaxies. Okay, Jesse. Mm -hmm. Take it. Yeah, could we turn the lights off, please? And is the mic projecting? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Oh, lovely. All right. Ooh, that's intentional. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh boy. Is it possible? <coughs> Whatever. All right, well, <laughs> it's recorded. It's recorded. I see. Welcome everyone, especially the new prospective students and also all of you returning uh, audience members. And, but that doesn't help, but let's imagine that we're in a dark room. <laughs> <laughs> we're in a dark room, and let's say that someone tells us that there is a burglar in the room. And for the sake of the argument, let's say this burglar is stealing 90% of the cosmic barrier fraction. <laughs> right, you do this. But let's believe this. And if we were to test this theory that this burglar exists, we would take a flashlight and maybe shine in one area of the room, like so. Nothing there, so we shine at a different patch of the sky. Oh, actually, there might be something. Is that a mosquito? Is that a mustache? Who knows? So we keep investigating. It's like, ooh, hmm, that could be a cloud, that could be a glove. And then this line of inquiry basically motivates us to shine a spotlight through the whole line of sights until we find that indeed there's a burglar taking away 90% of your baryons from your galaxies. Of course, this burglar is referring to the circumgalactic medium. The circumgalactic medium <laughs> does not have a mustache, um, but it does purportedly steal or reserve 90% of the baryons um, in the universe. So the CGM, or the circumgalactic medium, is a very elusive structure but we have some ideas about the key processes that go on in this structure. So on the left-hand side is a beautiful watercolor painting um, from a seminal ARA article on what the CGM could include. Right? So key processes include accreting gas directly from the IGM onto the gas, or sorry, onto the galaxy. There's also a bunch of just diffuse hot gas sitting out there at 10 to the 6 Kelvin. There's gas that's been launched straight out of the disk due to feedback from stars, black holes, what have you. 
And some of these gases actually outflow all the way back into the CGM, maybe in the IGM. So these are the key processes we think that are going on in the CGM. And indeed, the mass budget of the CGM is significant. I should have thought that this is going to be hidden a little bit. So this is an attempt to sort of account for this so-called missing baryon fraction in the circumgalactic medium. So the bottom two curves, the solid painted curves, those are what we know how to observe. So stellar light and gaseous light from disks directly. And we want the fraction to be up at 1, because 1 divided by 1 should be 1. And as you can see, as a function of um, the galaxy mass, the galaxy stellar mass, there is a large discrepancy in the amount of matter you can observe in stars and gas in the disk and the actual mass you would expect from, let's say, the CMB. And all these histograms, all two of them, are showing observational estimates of missing mass that can be included in the circumgalactic medium at these two different points. So the colored points are the lower limit to the amount of gas in each phase that is observed. You might notice that there's not much. And then these shaded areas are showing the maximal amount of mass that can be accounted for in these different phases, whether that be cool, warm, cold, hot, so on and so forth. So clearly, there's a very large amount of uncertainty in the actual mass that is contained in the CGM, but it potentially could really explain the discrepancy in the amount of observed baryons and the amount that we expect. And the big question is, how do we actually complete this observational view of the circumgalactic medium to answer this question, but also many other things, like how do galaxies form? How are they regulated? How is star formation regulated? How is it quenched? So on and so forth. So all these things are really, really answerable in the circumgalactic medium. So if this is a really difficult thing to observe, why even try? And that's because I'm trying to suggest that there is a different way forward. And this um, artist rendition slash simulation is showing the former picture, but in a more resolved view, focusing on the cold phase specifically. And by cold here, I mean roughly 10 to the 4 Kelvin. That's still pretty dang hot in terrestrial standards. But you can see in blue what all the cold gas is doing next to the galaxy. So you might notice immediately that it is already tracing a lot of the major components of the CGM, such as these large-scale inflows. Exactly whether or not they detach or attach to the disk is a big sort of a debate. You see these cold gas clumps that are being entrained in these large-scale outflows. Um, you see, of course, satellite galaxies and cold gas being accreted directly onto the galaxy. And if you zoom into a patch of the sky right here, you might or might not even see <laughs> cold clumps just spontaneously forming out of thermal instabilities. So clearly, cold gas has the potential to not only trace a lot of the structures already in the CGM, but also reveal things about the thermal instability um, of the CGM as well. Another sort of uh, feature of the cold gas is that modern simulations, as they push resolution, as they push volume, they're producing a lot of different predictions for what the cold gas is actually doing. Um, so having an observational counterpart to what the cold gas is doing in the CGM could greatly help uh, develop modern simulations. But the most important part is that it's readily accessible from optical, so cheaper than space telescope, uh, spectra. So let's talk about optical spectra for a bit. And let's not just talk about it, let's talk about the most amount of optical spectra ever taken so far, which is the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, or DESI to be short. So DESI is an instrument, as you can tell. Um, it is mounted on the male telescope uh, out in Arizona. And in a very brief number of numbers, it points 5,000 fibers all at once. So it's taking 5,000 spectra all at the same time. And as of last year, these are conservative numbers, but it's taken tens of millions of spectra of bright galaxies, of stars, and quasars, all of which can act as lovely little flashlights. Um, I'd like to take this moment to uh, thank our sponsors and our 69 participating institutions. More on this later. So let's go back to our analogy of the burglar. When we were trying to find our burglar, we shined a, or shun, a spotlight into the patch of the room. In DESI world, in the CGM world, this is exactly the same as looking at a patch of sky in, along some line of sight and then using the bright galaxies along that line of sight as a flashlight collectively. 
You can imagine doing this to one singular galaxy as well, but it's often advantageous to stack the flashlights together. And in particular, we have a good idea of what the intrinsic sort of shape of the spectrum of the galaxy is. So we can divide that out from the data and then stack those spectra. And that's what you might see. A lot of the text is right where I'm standing. Um, I'm going to go over here. So this is zooming into a patch of the DESI optical spectrum where we see a very curious uh, anomalous absorption. And you see a pair of absorption, a pair of absorption, um, also known as a doublet. And this is precisely the sodium D doublet. So sodium D is a neutral atom. Um, it has a very low ionization potential, so it really probes the cold, dense phase of matter. And also, you know exactly what separation and line ratios are. So when you see it in the data as an anomaly, you know exactly what it is. And similar to our flashlight, if you point towards a different patch of the sky, you might see another feature pop up. And you might notice that this first set of doublets are roughly around the zero velocity um, that is at rest with respect to the sun. And then the secondary doublet is at some receding velocity at 100 kilometers a second. And that's telling you that these two absorption features are coming from different parts of the galaxy. For example, it could be coming from the local ISM, the interstellar medium. And that one could be coming from the circumgalactic medium at a more higher velocity that is further away. So now that we have two lines of sight, we can move on to the entire sky. And this is what it looks like. Note that here it is preliminary. But we're viewing now the strength of sodium absorption um, in coordinates of the galaxy. So this blank chunk of the sky is the galactic plane, where we do not collect optical spectra from DESI. And then this large chunk over here is the southern sky, where we do not have access to, because DESI is in the north. And again, the colors are showing you sort of the strength of the sodium absorptions uh, that can translate to the total amount of gas along that line of sight, or the column density. Now, the entire sky is a lot to take in in one slide, so let's just like focus in on this one patch of the sky. Let's zoom in. So that's what the sky looks like in sodium D. But you, and, and then this red bar, sorry, this yellow bar is indicating what the size of your line of sights are. And nothing's really stopping us from actually going to higher and higher resolutions of stacking these galaxy spectra and looking at sodium absorption. Of course, your map does get more noisy, but always remember that this is your pixel size. So structures that are much longer than this pixel size are real. Now, taking back to sort of what we do know already, we know that H1 is an excellent probe of gas in the sort of 10 to the 4 to maybe slightly harder than that phase. It is a mix of the cold neutral medium and also the warm neutral medium. So we take the same patch of the sky in H1 and compare it to sodium. And then you might already see some key similarities and differences. Uh, key similarities include, roughly speaking, they're in the similar part of the sky down here. But of course, the differences are that they are very different in spatial scale. This is a nice little movie, um, sort of going back and forth between these two things. And in the last two slides, I want to really highlight that so this is, most of this is coming from the local ISM. But structures that we know for certain that are coming from the CGM are these so-called H1 high velocity clouds. So of course, the easy thing to do is project this onto the DESI footprint, cross match it with where we have high velocity sodium absorbers, and simply compare those two features. So this is showing the sodium measure velocities and the H1 measure velocities. You can see that it's a nice one-to-one -one line. But a really curious feature is when you compare the densities, the sodium um, absorbs densities are much higher than the suggested H1 densities. So what we have done is, um, and actually you can see in the map as well, in H1 you see that this is this large diffuse structure versus in sodium, it's really this one pixel that has a lot of column density in it and nothing outside of it. So if this is real, if you look at it with something like the VLA, something with a large, much higher angular resolution, you should resolve something that is indeed higher column density. Um, indeed, that is what have we done. This is ongoing work with Theo O'Neill, another grad student in our department, and Eric Kosh, a graduated grad student or postdoc uh, in our department. And indeed, when you zoom into that patch of the sky, we have a positive detection of something that is very clumpy and dense. And with that, I would like to end with the conclusion slides. Thank you. And then.
the suspicion would be to argue that there is outflow from the Milky Way disk, but, but it could also be accretion from outside. For example, the Magellanic clouds have these trails of gas around them. So would you see any, any correlation with satellites? Well, of course, so these two features are definitely a part of the large Magellanic clouds because the LMC comes in here and sort of lies in this region where we don't have data. But the part that we're looking at is right over here. So it's just spatially very far away from where the LMC is. Um, it's impossible to roll out the association because we don't have good kinematics on the gas. But I'd be surprised if it were an LMC-induced structure. I think it's the material coming out of this. I would be careful about like uh, applying a sort of grand fountainous picture here because what we are seeing is really teeny tiny things, like very small clumps. This is a, entirely an arc minute wide um, that is sort of isolated from everything else. So it's really hard to say if this is just something hanging out there on its own versus if it's part of like a much larger structure. So that is of course where the follow up work will be headed towards. How many features are typical in a spectrum that you see? Like you had, you showed an example of two absorption spectra. Do you see many more in some, some spectrum? So at this wavelength resolution, I think two is the maximum I would believe in. Um, of course, with higher resolution spectra, such as the MMT hexashell, you can see on average like three to four lines of si like uh, different pairs of absorptions. Um, so it all depends on your spectral wave uh, resolution. And what is the size of the clump? So this would be around, I think, three parsecs at 10 kpc was my math. Okay, so like a molecular cloud. And what is the Ooh. mass? Um, well, we don't know the mass yet, but I'd be surprised if, the, if this was a molecular cloud out in the halo. Maybe it is, but I think it's atomic gas. And there are no stars there. Not that I know of, no. Okay, well, let's thank uh, Jesse again. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Marta Reina Campos and I'm really excited to be here today. I'm a CIRA fellow at uh, CIRA in Toronto, but I'm also associated with McMaster University. And today I wanna talk about how we can steer up the ISM using cluster feedback. In the Milky Way, we see these gravitationally bound stellar systems that are fairly massive, fairly old, and fairly metal poor, which we know as globular clusters. When we look at many other galaxies in the local universe, we see that basically any galaxy we look at, they host these type of clusters, which is interesting um, because they're, they seem to be very difficult to form. Um, in terms of what fraction of the mass of the galaxy they correspond to, it's a really small fraction. However, when we look at the young counterparts of these objects, we see that there are uh, star clusters that are forming in local galaxies, galaxies in the local universe that have very specific conditions for their gas. They have to be star forming. Um, there's a plethora of studies looking at this topic, but a very recent uh, work by J.G. Uh, Sun using the data from the FANGS collaboration shows that by looking at clams in higher resolution ALMA data, they can identify star clusters in different evolutionary stages all the way uh, up to uh, the um, gas expulsion phase. So that's very interesting because they can see this process of star cluster formation from when they're deeply embedded in their gas all the way to when they're actually gravitationally bound. And what's interesting from this study is that they are uh, calculating that about 
30 to 50 percent of the star formation rate in this star bursting ring is coming in these uh, young massive clusters. This is true in the local universe, but now we're starting to see that this is also true at high redshift. So high, the James Webb Space Telescope is revolutionizing our field because it's allowing us to see farther and farther back in time. We already had seen some uh, proto-globular cluster nurseries at Redshift 2, Redshift 3 with HST, but now we're seeing more and more examples. So these are just three very recent examples in the literature where they're seeing massive star clusters. These are objects that are 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses at Redshift 6 in the Sunrise Arc, Redshift 8.3. Uh, in the Firefly fire, fire Sparkle, and then Redshift 10 in the Cosmic Gems Arc. And this is really, really exciting because this is only 500 mega years post Big Bang. So first of all, how did they form so early in the uh, history of the universe? But the fact that these star clusters account for the vast majority or a significant chunk of the mass of the galaxy, and that these galaxies are so small, indicate that the uh, feedback that they're going to produce might have a significant effect on the evolution of these galaxies. But even if these are the tip of the icebergs for the galaxy population, we are seeing that there's um, the rest of the star formation is also going to be clustered. And even though they don't remain as gravitationally bound star systems, their dispersal timescales are of the order of tens of mega years. So their feedback output is, is going to happen when they are still clustered. So we need to take into account when we're modeling galaxy formation and evolution because the star clusters are prime sources for feedback. Uh, we see in the local universe also from uh, these exquisite data from the FANGS collaboration that you can relate the ISM features and turbulence to the star cluster population present in these galaxies. Star clusters have also been suggested as the main drivers for the formation of ultra diffuse galaxies. UDGs are these very peculiar type of galaxies that they're extended, they're the size of a Milky Way, but they have the mass of a dwarf. And what's very interesting for a subset of these galaxies is that they host a large number of very massive clusters. So what's suggested is that these galaxies underwent a huge starburst early in their history, they form very massive clusters, and and the feedback from these clusters sort of disrupted the entire galaxy, quenched the star formation, and led to the expansion of the Darmate halo. Also because we're seeing star clusters so early on in the history of the universe and we're seeing them in UV light, there's a suggestion that the cluster feedback might be a, a very efficient way to carve uh, tunnels so that the ionizing radiation can leave the natal environments and they might be sources for rayonization. So all of these questions are extremely interesting, but how can we model these numerically, self-consistently? So how can we bridge the scales between star clusters, which are of the order of a few parsecs, and galaxies, which have uh, radii of a few kiloparsecs. The prescription that I'm showing today uses a numerical technique that is called sync particles. In my simulations, star formation is going to be split in three different steps. First, gas particles are going to be tagged as star forming given a certain criteria, and they're going to form these sync particles. Sinks initially are going to be starless, and they represent dense clumps of gas. As sinks grow mass either via gas accretion or by hierarchically merging one with another, they can form stellar populations within them. And what's interesting uh, of what we've done is that the stellar populations are not described by a single metric of properties, but actually we're quantizing the mass in different stellar populations that are distinct in age and metallicity. And by doing that, we can track the evolution and the feedback from each of these stellar populations. So this figure is showing the feedback output for a single star cluster in my simulations. This panel here is showing the mass, mass loss rate, luminosity emitted by each star population, and then the energy injected as a function of time. And you can see that first the scene forms. There's a first star population in this star cluster that is outputting mass and kinetic energy according to OB and HGV winds, and it also has some radiation being emitted. At some point afterwards, uh, there's a merger with another subcluster that brings its own stellar population that also has mass and OB uh, ejection and also its own luminosity, and the same happens later on with a third population. And um, by, tying, by tying the feedback properties to each of these stellar populations, we can then uh, use the properties of these overall uh, populations within star clusters and see how they're affecting the interstellar medium. So this is what I've done uh, so far with a large suite of 
very simple toy models. So these are spherical clouds embedded in a diffuse medium. The clouds have 10 to the 7 solar masses at 100 solar mass resolution. So this is just very simple because the first thing I want to study is how different numerical choices affect the growth of star clusters and how they affect the ISM. This movie that I'm going to play now is showing the evolution of this toy model with my prescription for cluster feedback and the uh, same one where the things, the star clusters do not grow in mass. So these are just single stellar populations of a given age and uh, mass. So if I play the movie, you'll see that the cloud is starting to collapse, it's developing filaments, star formation is starting to happen, it's ionizing the medium, the gas is getting hotter. And in the case where we have cluster feedback, it, the evolution is faster and the cloud gets ionized and disrupted quicker than if we don't do this. Um, we can look at some metrics describing all of these clouds, and today I'm just showing the formation efficiency. So this is how much mass is forming in stars as a function of time for the evolution of my clouds. And the solid lines are showing the star cluster formation. So when I'm just changing how these things are growing with mass, so which physical processes are affecting the growth of star clusters, I see that both my fiducial prescription and the case that uh, they represent single stellar populations, you get more or less the same formation efficiency, which is great because it means I didn't break anything. Um, but if I just account for gas accretion or hierarchical mergings, I basically form no star clusters. So this is telling us that star clusters form via both mergers and gas accretion and that doing either of the other is not enough. We can also modify different feedback mechanisms. And what I'm seeing is that if there's no ionizing radiation, which is the main difference between these two set of, of lines, um, if there's no ionizing radiation, you basically form way more stars than you would expect to. And the reason for this is that uh, once the star clusters start outputting ionizing radiation, they're heating up the gas around them, and the gas accretion is decreasing, and therefore as the star cluster growth is being suppressed with time. Just to end, I want to say that uh, as part of the different metrics that I'm looking for these toy models is mass resolution. Because if we want to do these in galaxies, realistically, cosmological zoom-in simulations run at these mass resolutions. So this is how my cloud would look like at 10 to the 4 solar masses. And this is high resolution for them, especially at the Milky Way mass scale. However, if we go to dwarfs, uh, for even for a cosmological zoom in simulation, we might be able to afford these 10 solar masses. And as you can see, by decorrelating stellar, the uh, star formation, you get a, or by it lowering the resolution of your simulation, you get a very different picture of your cloud, and you get a very different picture of the stellar populations within uh, the cloud and eventually within the galaxy. So I just want to end by showing this same, uh, this same figure, but then animate it. Um, so now I'm showing, so this same figure is showing these clouds are evolved with my cluster prescription, these ones with the standard star formation, and now they're color coded by the temperature. And as you can see in the evolution of these clouds, first of all, lower resolution evolves faster, and then if you have cluster feedback, you're getting your gas hotter faster than if you don't account for this cluster feedback. Um, so this is all for me. If you're interested, I'm talking tomorrow at our Lars Hans Quiz uh, meeting, so more then. Thank you. The results must depend on the sensitivity of the mass function of stars, right? If you have more massive stars, then you will get much more feedback. Yeah. And then uh, it's possible that uh, at rates above 10, the mass function of stars is so heavy. Have you looked into the difference? So I haven't yet, but that's definitely something that is in the works. Uh, something that's it's, uh, very interesting is that uh, because we're working with these toy models, we can play with any of the numerical choices we make. So changing the IMF is one of them. The other change we want to make is massive stars are in binaries. And binaries affect stellar evolution. They affect when, when they produce supernovae, how much mass goes into supernovae, what are the mass transfer, what are the yields. So I'm working with a grad student at McMaster trying to incorporate that in the simulation. Yeah. Um, so, do these uh, stellar clusters, at the end of the day, become globular clusters? That's a great question I cannot answer at the moment. Uh, these are only running for 15 mega years and they're just clouds. Uh, once I have a cosmological zoom in, I'll come back to you. Please, yeah. Firstly, whether they remain bound, 
And do they, at late times, look like global addresses? So they will remain bound by definition because they are, um, I'm assuming that the clusters are internally unresolved. So anything that forms, for now, it's bound. Eventually, there will be a, a subgrid prescription to say, this is the bound fraction. Um, but something that we're starting to see, which is very interesting, is that global clusters have a peculiarity, which is they have chemical abundance spreads. And uh, when I look at the stellar populations within my clusters, I get spreads. They go in the wrong direction because I don't have the right enrichment mechanisms, but you get the spreads. So that's going to be very interesting. And that is from the mergers. And that's from the mergers and the in situ gas spreads. Yeah. Nice. That's really cool, yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. You showed the, the Watkins paper that has all these bubbles um, yeah. uh, in, in a beautiful image of the galaxy. And, and it seems like the bubbles interaction is really important uh, in the star creation evolution. And I'm just curious whether the toy model that you use has enough realism to capture the, the formation of clouds at the intersection of these bubbles. Oh, they don't. Uh, yeah. So the, the toy model for now is just allowing to, ta to decide which are the best numerical choices for us to start running this type of isolated galaxy simulations, which are going to be very expensive. Um, so because there are, so many, there, there are so many things that you can change that might affect your results, we decided to go simple at first, understand the numerics, understand the effects, and then choose a set, and then we will start running uh, isolated galaxies like this, but also cosmological zooms of dwarfs to see if we can get UDGs, for example. Sumatra, just to be more pedagogical, can you explain? So what we are seeing on the right-hand side is uh, a gravitationally lensed galaxy, right? So we yeah. see the arc, and so what can we tell from <laughs> looking at the arc? Um, so you see very small clumps in it, and how big are they, how much mass? So for um, for this particular cluster, but oh, sorry, for this particular arc, but also for the other three that I was showing in the previous slide, um, the star. So what people are uh, doing is that they're first identifying these arcs in gravitational lens galaxy clusters, and then they're doing the source reconstruction. So they're moving, um, they're applying the lens model so that they can get the uh, galaxy at the source. And they're trying to then they're sort of quantifying the masses between 10 to the 5, 10 to 6 solar masses. Here, they're 10 to the 6 solar masses. And the sizes are upper limits of a few parsecs. So they're very consistent with what we would expect uh, proto-globular clusters to look like. And in fact, in the middle image, there is a mark for a single star, right? That's Arundel. Uh, no, no, this one, yeah. Yeah, right, that's a single star. Yeah, this is this is a particular case where there's a star that's crossing the caustic and it gets like, highly magnified. And for what redshift is it? The star is at redshift 3, I want to say, but it might be completely wrong. It's remarkable we can detect a single star. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. It's very, this work is very, very impressive because it's allowing to see so early on in the history of the universe that we have no idea how these things form so early.
Yeah, yeah, definitely, for sure. Happy to talk more. Let's thank uh, Marvin again. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, nice to see many of you, meet most of you. Um, I'm Jared Goldberg. I'm a postdoc at the Flatiron Institute Center for Computational Astrophysics. I, by training, am a stars and transients theorist. So I think about single stars and sometimes stars with just a binary companion. And I try and understand the structure of these stars, the evolution of these stars, and then what it looks like when they explode, which is a function of that structure and evolution. And so a lot of this connects to what we've just been seeing and talking about because these are the processes that drive the winds, that drive the feedback, that stir the galactic and circumgalactic medium. And just so that we're all on the same page, uh, especially I didn't know really what a star was when I was applying for PhD programs and got in because I did physics as my undergrad. So we start with a cloud of gas, it collapses, it forms a star. At some point, it starts fusing hydrogen into helium in the core. If the star is massive enough, that helium fuses heavier and heavier into carbon, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, iron. And then the core gets you know, big enough that under its own gravity, it'll collapse, release subatomic particles called neutrinos into the, into the star. That whole thing will explode as a type 2 supernova, that's just nomenclature. It'll leave a black hole or a neutron star as a remnant. It recycles that gas, dust, metals, everything into, the, uh, into you know, new clouds that form new stars. And there's a big question also, question mark, is kind of like, what drives the structure, the evolution, the winds during this kind of phase? So while that core is forming, the, the of heavier and heavier things, the envelope actually of the star expands. The core contracts, the envelope expands, and it grows out to like the orbit of Jupiter, basically. These are red supergiant stars, or if they blow off enough material, they can become yellow and things. And so like the winds, the interactions in this phase really shape the structure of the star, and these are things we really want to understand well. And one way we can do that is we can see stars that explode, and then go back into archival data and say, that was the star that died. Right? So we see something get really bright, fade, and you know, on human time scales. And today I'm going to be talking, I've done a lot of work on a lot of different parts of this, but I, today I'm going to be talking about a new project involving type 2b supernovae. So these are yellow progenitors. This is an HR diagram, so uh, temperature, it gets hotter as you go to the left colder as you go to the right for some reason, and brighter as you go up. The some reason is historical and involves colors and, and, and just categorizing stars. But anyway, um, when we see type 2b supernovae, when we see explosions that look a certain way, their progenitors are yellow. And what that's inferred to be is actually a core that's this layered core fusing heavier and heavier things and then a very low mass extended envelope. Something like, you know, it's extended, so it's 100 to 300 solar radii. So like the, radi you know, the Earth's orbit in our solar system rather than Jupiter's orbit in our solar system. And there's only about 0.1-ish solar masses of hydrogen in that, that only 0.1 solar masses. Well, the star is 10 solar masses, so 0.1 is actually a very small amount of that that's left as hydrogen. And just to say it out loud for the room, and you know, when I give this talk to supernova audiences especially, everyone is obsessed with like, the, core, the, the structure of the core and the explosion mechanism. And it is true that the properties of that core determine whether the star explodes, what energy it explodes with. 
but it's really the envelope of the star that determines what that explosion looks like and therefore mediates whether or not we can infer anything based off of observing these explosions. Right, so type 2b supernovae, I've said it a lot, 2b or not 2b is 2p, uh, you know, what, what do they look like? Well, they have this early peak. It gets really bright really fast on kind of a time scale of a week. There's no time on this axis, this is about a week. Uh, this shock cooling phase, it's called shock cooling as the shock travels through the star. And well, the shock hits the surface, photons escape out, the thing expands, you kind of see the outer layer. As time goes on in a supernova, you see deeper and deeper in. It's like you're looking at the surface and then you're looking deeper and deeper in. Right? So the shock cooling phase isn't always seen, but when it is, it can be really informative because that probes the surface layers. Then photons diffuse out of the bulk of the ejecta, kind of out of this cord layer. This is the Arnett phase. And then at late times, we have this luminosity tail that's powered by the radioactive decay of nickel-56 to cobalt to iron, kind of like a type 1a supernova that's used for cosmology, but a little bit less nickel in these. And it's these early peaks that I want to interrogate further because these are probing the state of the envelope of the star, the hydrogen-rich envelope of the star that uh, we want to connect to things like its winds, its history, its structure, and you know, all of that. Right? And so as it turns out, this first peak is sensitive to a few things. One, it's sensitive to how much energy there was in the explosion. More energy, it's brighter. It's also sensitive to what the radius of the star was at the time of the explosion. And it's also sensitive to kind of how much mass there was there. So you can see this is a plot from a paper that Daichi Hiramatsu wrote uh, while we were in grad school together that uh, we found basically kind of like point a few solar masses of hydrogen can give you something that looks like these early peaks, right? And so, you know, there's, there's no plateau because there's not enough hydrogen that recombination causes a plateau. Can talk more about that. I did a lot of work on two Ps, um, right? And because of this, you actually see through the whole envelope. So it's not just the circumstellar material you see in this early phase, but actually deeper and deeper into the envelope, right? So it's that entire hydrogen envelope mass, albeit small, that kind of sets this early peak along with this radius and explosion energy. So now, what can we do? Well, we go to observations, and we can say, you know, we can apply models for this shock cooling phase, and look and see that depending on what you assume specifically for the density profile, density is a function of radius, of those envelopes, you can get order of magnitude differences in what hydrogen envelope mass you infer. So these are all fits to one event with just saying, the only difference, and especially here in this SW17, look, this is, you know, this one says kind of 0.4 solar masses. This one says three solar masses, right? So you get, depending on the only difference here is what you assume as the slope of that density profile, right? And so you get, yeah, order of magnitude differences. This is bad, right? And we can ask, as stellar theorists especially, well, what should these density profiles be? What, you know, how should density fall off in these envelopes? And so to do that, I turn to what I like to call stellar engineering, because it's a little bit of physics and a little bit of uh, fudging equations. If you want to make a star on your computer, simulate it from birth to death, Really, the only way to do that is to assume it's a sphere. That gets your computation time down from more time than we you know, have transistors to something you can run on your laptop in a few hours. And then we can simulate lots of them. We can then do this with different tricks to blow off the, the mass so that you have a star that loses enough mass and then becomes yellow. We can do this via what's called relaxation techniques. We can do it just by cranking up the winds. We can also do it by taking a binary companion star and using that to strip the envelope off. And so I had a, an undergraduate this past summer, Ayana Mann, who uh, we, we explored this. And so you can see which ones become red, yellow, and blue. The more mass you lose, the bluer you get. Um, and so what I, one of the things Ayana found that has also existed in the literature was that there's sort of a relationship between the total mass in the hydrogen envelope and the radius of the star. As it, and so also, uh, plug for Ayana, she will be on the, uh, she's on the REU market this year and will be on the uh, P1 
PhD job market in the fall. So keep your eyes out for her. She's great. Um, anyway, so as it turns out, your choices for your stellar engineering do change the answer and can change it pretty appreciably. So really just look at, this is the same plot. It's log of the mass of hydrogen versus the radius of the star. Bigger is up and then you know, more hydrogen is to the right. And so the three curves, the, the blue, red, and purple, are all using a certain prescription for how we treat the surface of the star, how we treat the energy that's transported by convection. And then the black one is different. And no matter what we do for the winds, basically doesn't matter. But how we treat convection in the star really does. And so you can see, like, sort of order of magnitude differences in what hydrogen envelope mass you have that gives you different, uh, you know, that gives you a given radius. And the other thing is that not only does it, oh, I have, all right, well, <laughs> I, we'll get, okay. Uh, not, not only does it give uh, differences in the, uh, not only does it give differences in the number, it also gives differences in the profile. So you can see this one has less and it's wigglier. This one's more. These slopes are different, especially here. right? And all of this is probed. And the other thing is that these are kind of spherical cow models. right? It's convection and radiation that matter. And these are fundamentally 3D effects. So I, I, cheated, I, I lied a little bit, which is we can simulate parts of these stars in 3D for some short amount of time. You can't do birth to death, but you can do in months on a supercomputer thousands of days of this convective structure. And one of the things that we see already is these aren't just spheres. They have this you know, small scale turbulence. We have pulsations that are happening in the star. Um, and there are these fluctuations. And sometimes they even launch these mass loss events. Some of them are unsuccessful, and they rise and fall. And then some of them actually manage to drive a successful outburst. Here's the density on the bottom and the velocity on the top. And the successful outbursts actually sometimes even manage to make it out. OK, so what does this do? Well, at any given time, as a function of viewing angle, that makes your density profile messier. Right? Because there are shocks in the outer atmosphere. There's you know, failed ejection events, some you know, successful ejection events. And similarly, because this thing is changing over time, at any given time, which when the star explodes, it takes a second for it to explode, about a day to, you know, for anything to happen. And these pulsations are happening on tens of days time scales. So structure is kind of frozen in. The supernova would sort of see a different structure, except in here. So I would say that you know, for people trying to learn things from 2Bs, observers, after about a week, you still see shock cooling emission. And so this is the better constrained part of the envelope. And then you don't have to worry so much about this messiness at the surface. So for the supernova observers in the rooms, that's one of the takeaway. Another, to connect back to sort of the galactic environment and things, is we can actually kind of quantify how much mass is lost. So this is a space-time diagram of the of the velocity. So blue is stuff that's launched outwards. Right? Some of them fail. Some of them succeed. We can kind of count and ask how much mass is launched. And we see something that's kind of like 10 to the negative 6 solar masses at a time at a rate of a few per year. Right? Something like this. And we can actually also compare. This is work with uh, Shelley, who's in the audience. Um, Shelley's been working on a prescription for how to handle some of this eruptive type mass loss in 1D models. And we can use these 3D simulations as kind of a point of calibration for the 1D theory. And as it turns out, when we take the number that we get from these 3D simulations, or at least some of them, and compare it to the numbers that Shelley's finding with her 1D implementation, where then you can actually simulate uh, you know, hundreds of stars in a matter of a day or, you know, days on, a, uh, on different nodes on the cluster, um, you can get these, yeah, you infer these different uh, masses. And we actually do pretty well. So the fact that this color agrees broadly with the colors around it is, is a nice success of this simplified 1D theory for just the mass loss rates. And then that can be also included in, uh, you know, connecting to galaxy simulations or other kinds of things uh, if you include that in your stellar models. 
So takeaways, right, in 1D, we're sort of the tail wagging the dog. We, what we assume about this convection, about this energy transport, shapes the envelope. Uh, and so you know, that shapes kind of what, the, what we will see in the supernova and also some of these other choices. Uh, the 3D models are underway. Some preliminary results are we see some of these successful and failed mass ejection events for this near surface area. And then these are also launching interesting, clumpy, you know, exciting, uh, vibrant winds at kind of like you know, 10 to the negative 5 solar masses per year or so throughout the star's life. Uh, there are next steps. I got to do more analysis. I'm going to run supernova shocks through the 3D simulations as well. Um, it's a great time, and uh, thank you all. And I yield for questions. With regard to this is a complex uh, situation, not just in yeah. space. You were focusing on the radial yes. dependence, but also in time, because yes. some people suspect that the star is doing something crazy in the, the last decades. Of Right. Yeah. So can you tell us about that? Or what, do you think there is something unusual happening just before this world? It's really hard to know. Sometimes we see something unusual happening just before the explosion. Right? We've never seen anything like that happen in 2Bs, but also they're a lot rarer than in type 2 plateau supernovae and the more common type where you retain most of your envelope until the very end. Um, this is just treating like Take a step back. Maybe something happens near the end. Maybe we're just loading a bunch of stuff into this region around the star, and that's what we're assuming is a mass loss that event ejection that we never saw. My suspicion is, especially because of how ubiquitous we infer some stuff around the star, compared to how rarely we actually see anything that would look like an outburst that we need, I'm suspicious of, of things that say these must be catastrophic events. And I prefer models that try and figure out, well, how do we stratify some of this stuff? How can we launch this with pulsations? I actually have a master's student right now working with myself and an observer looking at the stuff around Betelgeuse as maybe a proxy, you know, sort of a model or proxy, because we think Betelgeuse is probably not about to explode. It might, you know, there's sort of a one in 100,000 years, so one in 100,000 chance that it will tomorrow. But, uh, you know, looking, there is clearly stuff around it, so maybe trying to get a little bit more information from that stuff will shed some light onto the supernova problem. You are hopeful that it will happen in your life. Uh, I'm hopeful that it'll happen right while I'm on the faculty market. <laughs> is that now? <laughs> Questions? Comments? <laughs> yes. um, is there ever an environment realistic uh, enough that the density of the ambient environment would mm -hmm. matter in this whole story? I would say so. So at the center of, for example, when you're forming stars at the center of an AGN disk or something, then you are constantly feeding them, and they're constantly also trying to launch winds, and so this picture becomes a lot messier. Yeah, I would say that's one example of an environment. The other thing is if you have not just like a binary star system, but a multi-star system or something like that, then some of these interactions could also matter a lot. Yeah. Okay, we need to move uh, on. Let's of course, yeah, thank you. Oh, we'll Uh, hello? This is hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name's uh, Croy Francisco Park, and uh, I'm a grad student here, right here at Harvard Physics. Uh, I'm here today to present our recent work uh, using diffusion models. So diffusion models are actually really popular in generative AI these days. But here, we're going to use them to generate dark matter density fields 
uh, conditioned on some input galaxy map. So our end motivation here is to link simulations to observations. So in observational cosmology, you have galaxy surveys. And in the world of simulations, uh, you input your physics uh, or your dark matter model or your galaxy formation model into simulations. And usually these are bridged uh, by modeling kind of the galaxy formation. And, but today, we would like to do that link using machine learning. So in order to train machine learning, you usually need two things. You need some data, and you need a model. So for the data, we decided to use uh, this KML simulation suite, which, is, which spans uh, uh, various galaxy formation models and astrophysical parameters and simulates simultaneously the stellar density map and the dark matter density map. And for the model, so here I asked ChatGPT, what are the deep learning models for images famous these days? And the list goes forever. So there are so many. So how to choose the right model to use if we want to link between uh, galaxy density or stellar density map and the uh, dark matter density map? I think there are two types of machine learning models. So the first classes are deterministic model. So these are usually used for classification or regression task. It's basically trained to guess the best answer. So there you put the image of a dog into your AI. The AI usually looks like that these days. And yes, and you get the label out dog. And I think the other classes of models are called probabilistic models. So these ones, uh, they're not trained to predict an answer. They're trained to uh, model a distribution and generate samples from it. So, and actually, uh, so the training objective is also to mimic how well it mimics the distribution of the training data it's given. So, Yes, and one of the probabilistic models are diffusion models. And since 2021, so diffusion models are the state-of-the-art image generators. And they made it pretty explicit in this paper from OpenAI that they beat GANs, which were the previous model which are doing it. So yeah, so you've probably seen these like AI-generated images. AI hey, can draw these stuff from, from, it's all over the internet these days. So how do they work? So diffusion models, when you train them, first, you define a process where you take your data and you make it noise. You gradually add more and more noise until your data basically disappeared and you can't distinguish from the noise distribution. Now that part is easy, you just add more noise. The hard part, the machine learning is trained to do the hard part, so it tries to invert that process. So given a conditioning field and given some time step which defines the noise level, the model learns to predict how much and what kind of noise has been added to the image. So if you apply that chain backwards, you can go from the noise distribution to the data distribution. So at the end of the day, given a conditioning, you can generate uh, multiple dark matter density maps conditioned on some stellar density map by changing the noise seed. So this posterior distribution, so even though it has a big meaning in probabilistic modeling, uh, in the computer vision scientist, we're more focused on the sample quality. The big reason diffusion model is so famous these days is mainly because of sample quality, because there's really not much you can do from the posterior. So here, I use stable diffusion to generate dog images, which are conditioned on that dog. And you get a mean and a standard deviation, but there's really not much. What are you going to do with the most average dog possible? <laughs> yes. So. But however, this posterior distribution is really interesting to us astrophysicists because you probably want to generate samples which have the right power spectrum. But at the same time, if you want to generate a sample with the right power spectrum, the conditioning stellar mass is not enough. You need to hallucinate some filaments, like just some small filaments, to get the power spectrum right. But then if you have many samples, you can kind of actually see which filaments are reliably reproducible and which ones are basically just there to fill in the power spectrum right. So we call this uh, probabilistic debiasing of astrophysical fields. So it's debiasing because you're taking a biased tracer of the dark matter density field and then uh, generating an, an unbiased field. And then we call it probabilistic because you're not doing it in a deterministic way, but you're getting multiple samples consistent with the same stellar input density map. So yes, by consistent, I mean that the summary statistics match. So uh, here we're showing that the PDF, so that's kind of the histogram of the pixel values, and then the power spectrum of the field. So the shaded region you see is coming from the diffusion model. And again, this is tested on data, which of course the model hasn't been trained on. 
And the true, the answer uh, dark matter maps, par spectrum, and the histogram falls well within the sample distribution. We also find that the cross-correlation uh, stays uh, over 0.9 up to uh, wave numbers of 3h over megaparsecs. And we're not training an emulator. We're not training to predict the par spectrum here. We're actually generating fields. So we can do things which are more interesting, like you can tag some regions in the stellar map and then kind of try to estimate how much dark matter mass is around it. And what you can see is you can get a distribution of values, and the vertical lines you see are the ground truth values, and they fall well within the distribution uh, predicted by the model. And interestingly, we also find that the model can generalize across galaxy formation models. So here on the diagonal, you're seeing the cross-correlation plot we saw before. When the model is trained on some galaxy formation model and some simulation code and tested on the same one, but different instances, obviously. But on the off-diagonal panels, you're seeing that the model has been trained on one galaxy formation model and predict the dark matter density of a different, uh, using a different code and different galaxy formation model. And the cross-correlation mostly stays uh, reasonably high. And this, we've actually been rather surprised by this. So we've trained on 25 uh, megaparsec over H boxes, which are these camel suite. And then we actually had the idea of tested on a much larger cosmic volume. So this is illustrious TNG 300, and the box size here is almost like eight times bigger than the training data. And the model actually generalizes very well. And we were especially surprised by those two regions, A and B, because those have like the the amount of like, dark matter mass is not anything which is in the training data. So nowhere in the training data you had the input stellar density map, which looked like this, basically nothing compared to the training data. And yet the model generalizes as well. And we also plot the part spectrum. We've been pretty amazed that the part spectrum can actually uh, follow the, the, the ground truth pretty well up to the large scale modes, which the model has never been able to see. And finally, a lot of machine learning science is freak out when you go to real data, nothing starts working. But we're starting to work on it. So in 2021, there was a paper using the, a catalog of local galaxies to uh, reconstruct the dark matter map in the, in the uh, local area. And we basically took the exact same data and did a first trial to our, with our model. And then uh, we Yes, and thanks to the ITC GPU, because that model is now 3D. It's a huge model. We fit it in the ITC GPU just right. And uh, yes, and the model does reasonably. And actually, our posterior mean actually resembles pretty much uh, what they got. But they had uh, peculiar velocities. We didn't use that yet. So our map is it's a little bit less constrained. So yes, so our conclusion is uh, we used uh, probabilistic diffusion models for dark matter density field reconstruction. We see that they allow us to do probabilistic debiasing, and it generalizes across galaxy formation models and parameters. Uh, and actually, we're surprised that it also generalizes to much bigger scales in the training data. And we're working on uh, training the 3D model better and applying it to real data. And here's a small gift for the ITC. The peculiar velocity of the... Well, you reconstruct yep. the dark matter. Yes, but that's what you reconstruct is based on probabilistic arguments, not based on solving the equations of motion. Yes, that's right. So it's possible that you will get a solution that is not physically viable, isn't that? that that's right. And actually, actually, we would really like to kind of know that. And it would be good if there is a way to check whether the probabilistic modeling only looks good or it is actually like consistent. So it's actually good to have a... a better heuristic maybe than the par spectrum. The par spectrum is something which is sometimes easy to reproduce. But yes, we are trying to also uh, try higher order statistics or uh, to verify whether it actually makes sense or just looks good. Right. Another way to look at it is you can put more constraints on your reconstruction that you're not allowing the system to deviate from what physics can give you. Uh, yes. I don't know how complicated that is. Yes, that part is unfortunately isn't trivial, <laughs> but I, I think, as long as I know. 
Any other questions? Comments? Looks like everything was clear. Okay. Thank you so much. Let's Thank <laughs> you.